So good morning, everyone. Um, the good news is that this is the last uh, reflection. The bad news, it's going to be a marathon, so please strap in. Um, that's a picture of the house at the Becky where Don Bosco grew up. Um, before the Salesians started uh, renovations in the, in the early 50s. That's what it looks like today. And you can see poking over the behind, 200 metres up the hill at Colo Don Bosco, is the big basilica. And there it is, it's an enormous construction and you can see the big institute behind. And what I'd like you to do is to focus in on that image there. A mosaic and just compare, actually you can probably compare it better with the cars below in that photo. It is massive. Compare it with the size of the cars. So that's the image that's there, high on the exterior of the right transept of the Basilica of Don Bosco is this massive mosaic depicting Don Bosco superimposed over the image of the Good Shepherd. It faces out across the valley looking towards uh, Castel Nuovo, Don Bosco, and further on towards the, the snow-covered Alps. From the first time I saw this image, I was intrigued. It's stunning. It draws you in. Don Bosco appears neither young nor old, but yet not really middle-aged either. There's an agelessness about it. He's clean shaven, his hair's a little bit ruffled as if the wind is blowing past. There's a hint of a smile on his face. There's a serenity that's really obvious. And Don Bosco's eyes are looking straight out as if he has his eyes on you. His hands are extended out, a little down? Is it a gesture of invitation, welcoming, or of gathering, or of prayer, or perhaps all of those? Perhaps he's gesturing to the presence of the one who stands behind him. While the figure of Don Bosco is really distinct, the Good Shepherd is less so, a little vague, perhaps creating an air of mystery. He's looking out across Don Bosco's right shoulder, a bearded character, also with slightly ruffled hair, that same wind, is that the Ruha, the Spirit of God, rustling those locks? He glances slightly to the left, towards Don Bosco. And yet, he's also looking out as if he too is looking directly at you. He firmly grasps a shepherd's crook in his left hand. Maybe there's an indistinct lamb draped across his shoulders. Maybe not. It's obviously the good shepherd in search of the lost one. The superimposition of images is clearly saying something that we can understand something of Don Bosco and consequently his spirit, his charism, utilising the image of the good shepherd. 
This extraordinary piece of artwork is the work of Mario Boldani from uh, near Como, just north of Milan. It is said that his is an artistic life in search of the face of Christ. He's done religious works all over the world, including in many Salesian centres. Mario Bolgani knew the Salesian family and Don Bosco well. His numerous works of Don Bosco portrayed his face in ways that attempt to capture both his humanity and his sanctity, as if to say his humanity finds its fullest expression in his sanctity. He spent 10 years at Colle Don Bosco working on uh, the Basilica between 18, sorry, 1988 and 1998, working on a cycle of large scale works depicting the life and works of Don Bosco. Those dates are interesting. 1988 to 1998. It's almost inconceivable that the Don Bosco and the Good Shepherd uh, mural could ever have been imagined before 1980, 1988, the centenary of Don Bosco's death, when Father Vigano um, commissioned a Salesian profession cross depicting the Good Shepherd and the words, study to make yourself loved. You see, imagining Don Bosco and the Salesian work and mission in the light of the Good Shepherd is actually a recently, uh, relatively recent phenomenon, having its origin in Vatican II's call to return to the scriptures and our Salesian historical sources in order to rediscover the, the charism of our founder. Salesian use of Good Shepherd imagery emerges from the post-conciliar general chapters and becomes a central feature of the revised constitutions. And of course, it's, sim it's since become firmly established in our Salesian imagination. It may be surprising to some to learn that reflecting upon our Salesian charism in the light of the Good Shepherd stories is relatively new, as Frank Maloney points out in a terrific article that he's written on exactly this subject. Frank points out that Don Bosco never spoke about the Good Shepherd in relation to the Salesian charism. In his writings, Don Bosco did, of course, use the Good Shepherd texts, passages, but never in a way that reflect the way that we now use that image in reference to our Salesian mission, spirituality, and pedagogy. Frank writes, Don Bosco's self-understanding of, of this mission was not framed in terms of the image of the Good Shepherd. In fact, in fact, it would seem that Don Bosco never considers the possibility of its charismatic relevance for the work he was doing with young people. However, although Don Bosco may not have explicitly used these shepherd texts, he certainly lived them out in his own unique way of responding to his mission towards young people. In the image of the Good Shepherd, as part of an evolving tradition that looks beyond Don Bosco to the sacred scriptures, Frank reminds us that we have uncovered something essential to our charism. Just by way of a brief aside, there's another feature of the Basilica at Colle that points to the ongoing evolution of our Salesian charism, that massive a statue of the risen Christ. Sacrosanctum Concilium, the constitution on the sacred scriptures, the very first text promulgated by Vatican II, 
presented the mystery of Christ as the paschal mystery of his blessed passion, resurrection from the dead, and his glorious ascension. This emphasis on a fuller and much more extended understanding of the mystery of Christ pervades that whole document, and as a renowned historian notes, with the paschal mystery expressed in this way as one of its theme, the text subtly shifted a mindset among Catholics that since the Middle Ages had located the redemption almost exclusively in Christ's suffering and death. The text thereby implicitly promoted a shift in style of spirituality. This resurrection spirituality is given Salesian expression at Colin, not only in the massive uh, risen Christ statue, but also on the emphasis given to the Via Lucis, or the way of light, a set of 14 stations reflecting on post-resurrection gospel stories of Jesus and his disciples. The Via Lucis was proposed and developed by Father Sabino Palamieri, a Salesian priest at the Orps, in the late 80s and early 90s. That resurrection spirituality is now firmly reflected in our constitutions. Constitution 34, we walk side by side with the young so as to lead them to the risen Lord. It's also reflected in our understanding of Salesian youth spirituality as a spirituality of daily life, joy, and optimism in friendship with the risen Lord. Back to the Good Shepherd. Reading Frank's um, excellent survey of key shepherd texts in the Hebrew and Christian testaments, one of the things that becomes obvious is that the shepherd, who, as Frank uh, points out, always represents God, is personally active. In the Old Testament, the contrast between wicked and true shepherds is instructive. The wicked shepherd scatters and abandons the sheep, does not feed the sheep, does not strengthen the weak, heal the sick, or bind up the injured, nor have they sought out the lost or brought back the stray. Rather, they've ruled with force and harshness. However, the true shepherd calls, leads and feeds, protects and comforts, provides refreshment, a place of rest, leads away from evil and into the path of righteousness, gathers and brings back to the fold, promises to raise up other shepherds, searches for, seeks out and rescues the lost, gathers and feeds with good pasture, provides fresh water, binds up the injured and strengthens the weak, promises a covenant of peace, banishes wild animals and provides security and safety. In the New Testament, there is again a condemnation of wicked shepherds who do not know their sheep and lead them astray. On the whole, the evangelists do not abandon the traditional Jewish image of the good shepherd but extend it in a way unknown to the Jewish tradition, especially with the identify, identification of Jesus as the Good Shepherd and Jesus' self-identification with that title. Again, the shepherd is personally active in and amongst, for and with the sheep. The Good Shepherd uh, seeks out even going to ridiculous extremes, the Good Shepherd rescues, carries home, and then rejoices over the lost sheep found. The Good Shepherd teaches. He opens the gate. He is the gate. He calls his sheep, leads them out, goes ahead of them. He knows them, and they know him. He saves and protects. He offers his life. He offers life in abundance. He lays down his own life. 
He gathers his own, and he even gathers those outside the fold so as to bring them in. Most importantly, the good shepherd knows the father, and the father knows him, and they are one. In more recent years, um, both Father Vecchi and Father Chavez have been specific in positioning the Good Shepherd motif at the core of our charism for all members of the Salesian family. For example, Father Chavez, in preparation for the bicentenary of Don Bosco's birth, wrote, I am inviting you, therefore, dear members of the Salesian family, to draw from the wellsprings of Don Bosco's spirituality. In other words, from his educative and pastoral charity. It finds its model in Christ the Good Shepherd, and its prayer and its plan of life in Don Bosco's motto, Dami animas cetra tole, give me souls, take away the rest. Closely following this path, we are able to discover Don Bosco the mystic, whose spiritual experience lies at the heart of the way we live our Salesian spirituality today, in the variety of vocations which take their inspiration from him. And we ourselves will be able to have a strong Salesian spiritual experience. Yes, it's in being living shepherds praying and doing, being and acting, uniting our heart with the heart of Jesus the Good Shepherd, united as one with the Father, that we become true Salesian mystics who give living expression to the Dami animas, who lay down their lives for the young. So, crazy dream number one. Yesterday we said that our dreaming is in, intrinsic to our Salesian identity. And I, I concluded yesterday by hoping that we would dream big, dream and dream big, and perhaps dream a little crazy. Would it be too crazy to dream of Salesians throughout the Australia and the Pacific? SDB, FMA, lay partners, collaborators, Young people, yes, Salesians together who are true and good shepherds with and for each other and the young after the heart of Jesus, the good shepherd. So that's crazy dream number one. Crazy dream number two follows. That as good shepherds, we dream of being prophets of gentleness and loving kindness in the midst of a fractured, violent and divided world. SDB Constitution 11 reflects upon the Christ of the Gospels, who is the source of our Salesian spirit. It, sing, it sing, singles out the preoccupation of the Good Shepherd, who wins hearts by gentleness and self-giving. Yes, the Salesian Shepherd and the way of gentleness and loving kindness are so intertwined that it seems to me that it's difficult to see how they can be pried apart without destroying the integrity of both. The image of the Good Shepherd who wins hearts by gentleness and self-giving echoes the encouragement of the man in the dream to a frightened and confused young Johnny Bosco. You will have to win these friends of yours, not by blows, but by gentleness and loving kindness. For me, that's a direct invitation to reject division and violence and be prophets of that gentleness and loving kindness that is the essential hallmark of our Salesian charism as we reflected upon yesterday. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics for the financial year 21-2020, 2021-2022, an estimated not 8 million Australians, 41%, have experienced physical and or sexual violence since the age of 15. 
including 31% of women and 42% of men who've experienced physical violence, 22% of women and 6% of men who've experienced sexual violence. The situation in the Pacific is no better, perhaps worse. According to the United Nations, violence against women and girls in the Pacific Island countries is amongst the highest in the world, about twice the global average. Up to 68% of Pacific and women have reported experiencing physical and or sexual violence by a partner in their lifetime. Examining the graph, 16% of women surveyed in Fiji and 37% of women in the Solomon Islands report having been sexually abused as a child. 66% of Fijian women and 64% of Solomon Islander women report physical or sexual abuse by a partner across their lifetime. The number's 46% in Samoa. When it comes to non-partner violence since the age of 15, it's 62% in Samoa. 29% of women in Fiji, 18% of women in the Solomon Islands. In an article in the Samoa Observer by the editorial board of that newspaper in November 2022, there was concern raised about the alarming number of women seeking assistance from the Samoa Victim Support Group. The editorial board asked whether there's a culture of violence and abuse in Samoa. Quote, as Samoans, we are proud people. We are proud of our culture. We practice it and promote it. But is violence part of our culture, especially violence against women and children and the vulnerable? If it is, then we need to change this narrative. Statistics point to a picture of our society that we are not proud to discuss openly. We could go on painting an even uglier portrait of the pandemic of violence that infests our societies. We could talk about the violence being done to our planet and think of the, con the devastating consequences of climate change on our common home. We could consider the violence of war and conflict across the world, mass casualties and millions displaced. We could explore toxic social media experience of so many, including our young people. We can interrogate bullying statistics in schools or indigenous incarceration rates. We could examine the hostile and vitriolic structure of public and political discourse in societies that are fractured and seemingly irreparably divided. We could consider the educational, physical, health and mental health and employment impacts of, of poverty and the associated personal, social and economic costs. We could consider so much more, but I think we get the picture. Win these friends, not with blows, but with gentleness and loving kindness. This is our Salesian way, and we have something to offer the world. In such a violent and fractured world, engaging in gentleness and loving kindness is genuinely prophetic in the biblical sense of the word. The prophets of old revealed how the people of Israel wandered away from the covenant, how their rulers governed with oppression, and how the elite were corrupt and unjust and they called people back to a society as God envisaged it, provided the comfort and encouragement to enable others to renew their lives and live according to the covenant, to see the world through the eyes of God and with the heart of God. A 
applying this to our world, to our mission as Salesian family, we can see that the public prophetic ministry, as the scripture scholar uh, Walter Brueggemann suggested many years ago, is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. Yes, our Salesian gentleness and loving kindness is a prophetic countercultural sign for a violent and divided world. A gesture that protests and calls out, as well as calling, gathering, comforting, encouraging, accompanying, empowering, and uniting, as does a shepherd. So what then is this gentleness and loving kindness so precious to both Francis de Sales and St. John Bosco? Gentleness is, of course, almost synonymous with Francis. Yet the French word, douceur, that so characteristic of Francis and often translated as gentleness, is actually a notoriously difficult term to translate and has been rendered in English as such things as sweetness, gentleness, graciousness, meekness, suavity. Really, none of these uh, translations do it justice. These terms just don't resonate with our contemporary sensibilities. John Ryan, a renowned translator of Francis, um, of Francis's writings, describes Francis's use of de sure and similar words. He says that by such terms, Francis wishes to describe all that is truly good and rightly cherished and held dear, all that is lovely, loving and lovable, all that is merciful, kind and mild, all that is gentle even when most firm, all that checks and disciplines only to help us and bring us to what we should be, all that is bright and joyous in itself, and that can alone bring joy and peace to our hearts. In this sense, Dosher is a Christ-like, sorry, is a Christ-like quality, reminiscent of the Jesus who bids all to come to him and learn because he is meek and humble of heart. It's the goodness of character that emanates from one's inner dispositions and expressed in one's um, interactions with others. This disposition of gentleness and manner of acting towards our neighbour is the fruit of a heart that is already captivated by the love of God. Don Bosco's gentleness has been de defined by Father Stella as the trait which manifests one's sympathy, affection, understanding, compassion, and sharing in other people, in the lives of others. Gentleness, therefore, is connected to loving kindness, but, to quote Father Brido, it is not synonymous with weakness, permissiveness, or sentimentality. It is intelligent charity and loving dedication. It is the authority of a father who has in his hands the heart of his children. It is love that is expressed and felt, therefore, both affective and effective. This gentleness and kindness, loving kindness, so distinctive of Francis and Don Bosco, are the gift of one whose heart is conformed with the heart of Christ the gentle and humble shepherd. Paul places both gentleness and loving kindness amongst the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Pope Francis, when encouraging the recovery of kindness in Fratelli Tutti, notes that the Greek word that Paul uses for kindness describes an attitude that is gentle, pleasant, and supportive, not rude or coarse. 
individuals who possess that quality help make other people's lives more bearable, especially by sharing the weight of their problems, needs and fears. To me, that sounds like Salesian accompaniment. The placement, the placement of gentleness and self-control side by side in that list from Galatians is interesting to me. In fact, the two are partners. For gentleness live continually, constantly and consistency, consistently requires extraordinary self-control. We know that for both Francis and John, gentleness was a personal quality, one only with great self-mastery. We do not learn gentleness or loving kindness without cost. Gentleness requires asceticism in the traditional sense that it demands self-discipline and self-denial on a personal and spiritual level. It is the asceticism of daily life that continually chooses to love with a love that is patient and kind, that is never envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, that does not insist on its own way, that is not irritable or resentful, that does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth, a love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. A love that never ends. Yes, we know that gentleness and loving kindness are lived expression of a selfless love, a pure love that seeks to love God only for God's sake and neighbour for their sake rather than our own. This is why gentleness and loving kindness should never be misinterpreted as weakness or lack of courage and determination. As Francis says, there is nothing so strong as true gentleness and nothing so gentle as true strength. We know that from experience that gentleness requires true strength, commitment and perseverance patience over time. We also know that when we encounter a person of true strength of character, there is also a subtlety, a calmness, a depth, a gentleness about them. The gentleness of strength and the strength of gentleness both emerge from an inner self-alignment of the person with the heart of Christ. And for this reason, gentleness <coughs> is a beatitude. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. And this is challenging and difficult, especially as Francis says, for one who is not a person of great prayer. In his treatise on the preventive system, Don Bosco says that the three core uh, elements are reason, religion and loving kindness. We learn from the red letter to Rome that um, loving kindness can only be realised when we are present with our youngsters in, youngsters in a whole network of personal and educative relationships, both formal and informal. This loving kindness opens up the possibility of, of familiarity, getting to know each other, shared interests and experiences, showing an interest in the other's life. This familiarity leads to confidence, which opens the way to a mutual loving relationship, which is the foundation of a positive education. And we shouldn't underestimate the power of our gentleness and loving kindness. It shows basic respect for others. It demonstrates an appreciation of a person's absolute and inviolable dignity. It demonstrates our availability, openness and attentiveness. It opens the way for compassion and friendship. 
it invites a response and encourages a person to express themselves. It promotes <coughs> non-judgmental uh, listening and the sharing of stories and experiences. <coughs> it can be calming, healing and transformative for those who feel neglected, ignored, frustrated, anxious or depressed. It builds bridges and promotes dialogue. In a genuine and profound way, our Salesian gentleness and loving kindness enriches the quality of our of presence and facilitates that culture of encounter capable of transcending our differences and divisions that Pope Francis is advocating. Concerned that even the sense of belonging to a few uh, even the sense of belonging to a single human family is fading, Pope Francis has been promoting a civilization of love and proposes fraternity and social friendship, listening, dialogue, charity and compassion as ways of building a better, more just and peaceful world. And the possibility of this is optimized by kindness, as he explains in Fratelli Tutti. Kindness frees us from the cruelty that at times infects human relationships, from the anxiety that prevents us from thinking of others, from the frantic flurry of activity that forgets that others also have a right to be happy. Often nowadays, we find neither the time nor the energy to stop and be kind to others, to say, excuse me, pardon me, thank you. And every now and then, miraculously, a kind person appears and is willing to set everything aside in order to show interest, to give the gift of a smile, to speak a word of encouragement to listen amid general indifference. If we make a daily effort to do exactly this, Francis continues, we can create a healthy social atmosphere in which misunderstanding can be overcome and conflict forestalled. Kindness ought to be cultivated. It is not some superficial uh, bourgeois virtue precisely because it entails esteem and respect for others. Relations, um, once kindness becomes a culture within society, it transforms lifestyles, relationships, and the ways ideas are discussed and compared. Kindness facilitates a, the quest for consensus. It opens new paths where hostility and conflict would burn all bridges. So then, is there a characteristically Salesian way for us to be active shepherds and prophets of gentleness and loving kindness? I suggest our missionary spirit. Father Angel said he dreamed that one of the fruits of the celebration of the bicentenary of Don Bosco's birth would be a rekindling of missionary generosity. That was his dream then, and he repeated it after the last general chapter. That's because the missionary spirit is another core element of our charismatic identity. The zeal of the missionary sparked Don Bosco's imagination and the missionary ideal was close to his heart. As a young man, he himself wanted to be a missionary, a, pro a proposal which Father Cafasso discerned was not his calling. But the missionary imagination and the missionary zeal were always there in the heart and mind of Don Bosco, as indeed it was with Francis de Sales. In 1875, there was great excitement at the oratory as the first missionary expedition group prepared to leave for Argentina. There were celebrations in the Basilica of Mary Hope of Christians in Turin, and then Don Bosco accompanied the group 
and farewelled them in Genoa. When he returned to Turin, he found hundreds of letters from his boys begging to be missionaries. A few days, la a few days later, he gave a good night, encouraging all to be missionaries to each other. He insisted that being a missionary wasn't about extraordinary acts of heroism, but about sharing the love of God by simple acts of kindness, love and generosity on a daily basis. He commended Magoni for doing exactly this, writing letters to others, carrying water, making beds, sweeping, helping those struggling with their homework. There are particular aspects of the missionary spirit that enable us to be shepherds and prophets of gentleness and loving kindness. Firstly, missionaries are generous, adventurous and courageous. If they were not, they would never have left the comfort of their own nation or, and culture to proclaim the gospel. Missionaries have to be curious listeners, wanting to understand the language, culture and way of life of the people they're called to serve. Missionaries, as we know from the experience of this province, have to be adaptable and creative, making the most of opportunities as they are presented to them. And they have to be resilient to cope with the inevitable difficulties that they face. They have to be full of zeal for the mission. That is a great energy and enthusiasm. And enthusiasm is exactly the right word here. It comes from the Greek expression, meaning to be entheos, but to be inspired and possessed by God, filled with God. It's the missionary's trust that makes it all, uh, all uh, trust in God that makes it all possible. These are the qualities we all need, for we are all missionaries wherever we serve. When we think of, of the missions, we're usually thinking of mission ad gentis, to the peoples, go out to all nations. It's interesting to see another terminology entering our ecclesial vocabulary, and slowly, very slowly, penetrating our Salesian vocabulary. The mission intergentis among the people, which is an approach being developed and reflected upon across Asia, particularly those countries where explicit evangelization is difficult or even forbidden. It's a response to the perceived historical colonial mindset and Eurocentric mentality of many missionary projects. Mission intergentis is a new paradigm that adopts a non-confrontational, dialogical approach to societies with, various, with varied cultures, faiths, histories and customs. Father Maraviglia, the SDB counsellor for the missions, uh, points out that Missio intergentes is not in opposition but complementary to missio ad gentes. What distinguishes them are the two preceding prepositions which specify the attitude towards the gentes, towards the people. The preposition ad indicates an attitude that sees the other as the goal, the point of arrival, the receiver, while inter indicates being in the midst of a people, establishing a relational connectedness with them. The SDB regulations seem to have anticipated this style of missionary activity, even if it didn't name it as intergentis. In places where the religious, uh, Regulation 22 says, in places where the religious, social and political context does not allow forms of explicit evangelization, the congregation should develop a, and maintain a missionary presence of witness and service. 
in 2012, there was a joint FMA-SDB uh, study week on Salesian presence amongst Muslims. The idea of missionary presence of witness and service is strongly reflected in the documents emerging from that conference. In addition, there are three other key ideas that are repeatedly mentioned. Listening, dialogue, and in the words of Mother Yvonne, at that stage the Superior General of the Sisters, respect for the different traditions, cultures, and religious belongings. Salesian Sister Alaide Doretti, the former FMA General Counselor for Mission, made this impassioned appeal. Let us listen to what justice, reconciliation, forgiveness, hospitality, harmony, patient dialogue, open to novelty, smallness, the marginalised tell us. That, I think, is an approach of being and doing that reflects our Salesian gentleness and loving kindness. Whether our Salesian presences in Australia and the Pacific are predominantly Catholic or effectively post-Christian, this approach to living the preventive system can be an appropriate way to evangelise in dialogue and partnership with our young people and their families. I'll leave the last word to Pope Francis, who in Evangelii Gaudium said this, I dream of a missionary option. That is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything. And this is pretty radical. So that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, languages and structures, can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her own self-preservation. That's where I conclude our reflections for this week, wondering what our communities, our works, our localities, the localities in which we, we are present would look like if we truly dared to dream of adopting a missio intergentes approach to being Salesian shepherds who out of love of God and the young want to serve, want the people, want to serve our people as prophets of gentleness and loving kindness. As Pope Francis encouraged us, let us dare to dream and to dream big and to get others to dream and perhaps even a little crazy, that as Salesians, we might be shepherds, prophets, and missionaries. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.